Hi, I'm David Hill. I'm one of the co-founders of the Health Hub Project here in Palmerston North, New Zealand. We founded the Health Hub Project about five years ago on the principle that we believe that the current structures around health care provision are really not working for us, but also on the idea that health care provision is really the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, really always, and that we're not addressing the issues that create poor health, such as poverty, poor nutrition, poor housing, poor education, and so on. So the Health Hub project was built really to address those as well as the provision of health care. And I think the COVID crisis has really highlighted the need to try and bring all these structures together. And also with the rapidly changing circumstances of uh, trying to address an epidemic, how unprepared those structures have been to address the, these circumstances. In a very present article uh, by Bedford and her colleagues who came from actually uh, all, all over the world, um, from Nigeria, Ethiopia, India, the Netherlands and the UK, um, this was in Nature 2019, so last year. She actually talks about um, how ecology, urbanization, climate change, travel, public health systems, really urban creep, I guess is the best way to talk about it and how our closer contact with um, um, animals, indigenous species that we shouldn't be in contact with increase the likelihood of us encountering e epidemics and complex epidemics. And in fact, we're more likely to get these as time uh, uh, progresses. And what we really have to consider is our response to those crises. And uh, where we are now, uh, and I think the, certainly the COVID crisis has shown we're not really um, in any way prepared for this. Our response is nowhere ready for such a crisis. And yet we have to see what the recovery response is like. What she talks about in her article, which I think is the most um, important part, and I hope also you'll see the relevance of this in the talk, is that we have to combine knowledge and skills from all over the world and our own knowledge and skills um, to address this, bringing in people from different backgrounds, social sciences, research, development, diplomacy, logistics, crisis management, epidemiology, but it's become a real key issue in, in this current crisis. Um, but I think there's other parts of that if we talk of epidemiology. We have to also challenge the assumption which that knowledge is actually based on. The knowledge has really um, started with assumptions on westernized thinking around materialism, especially mathematical models, Western thinking around uh, uh, populations and population health. We could actually be learning a lot more from other ways of thinking from other cultures. So it's not just westernized thinking we need to bring into these constructs. We need to bring in other ways to alter our ways of thinking around such things as epidemiology, but also things like uh, our social sciences and research and development. So that kind of takes me onto the idea of, uh, of, of the talk, COVID, Freud and the small house at Allington. The idea of this is really to create a synthesis of thinking from the 19th century to where we are now and how history um, and patterns of human behavior have really remained the same. And however, our, our, our thinking as a society has progressed. The sad thing is, I think our dominant structures have lagged substantially behind the way our society thinks, the way it's developed, the way our moral and ethical thinking has changed. And once, once again, I come back to the idea that COVID has actually shown that there has been a, a, a real total disintegration of those structures and really demonstrated the fragility of those welfare systems. And if you look, for example, at some of the most advanced technological societies in the world, USA in particular, where the healthcare system and the like has just failed really to deal with the outbreak of, of COVID. It's just um, basically disintegrated. It's also demonstrated that underbelly really a vulnerability of our societies, how the progression of neoliberal thinking and neoliberal economics has demonstrated how precarious 
many of our people are. In New Zealand, it's expected that probably around 18 to 20 percent of our population live in a precarious way. What do I mean by precarity? It means those people who really don't know where their next dollar is coming from. It doesn't mean to say that they're not working. They may have multiple jobs, but they don't necessarily know where that next dollar is coming from. Certainly this crisis will make sure that that state is intensified. More people will be living precariously. Well, The, the Small House in Allington was actually a, a, a book by, by Trollope. Um, the Victorian novelists use a lot of, if, if everybody's, uh, any, anybody's, well, most of the Victorian novelists, but Trollope, Uh, in particular, use a lot of words. The, the nice word that uh, covers this is called prolix. We call it obfuscation. A lot of words to cover up what we intend to mean. And uh, Trollope also uses class. And it's a literary uh, a means of actually avoiding what we're trying to get at, what explicitly we're trying to say. And what we're trying, in, in terms of Trollope, of course, is obvious references to sex. Uh, what he also uses obvious references is to wealth and differences of wealth and class. And I'll use an example, and this is an example used by uh, Professor Cohen, who's a professor of literature at Maryland University, um, in, in his, uh, his thesis called Trollope's Trollope, which is a nice, elegant play on words, which he published in 1995. And he uses a, a, an example of Freud's uh, Endora analysis of case of hysteria. On that day, she wore at her waist a small reticule of a shape which had just come into fashion. And as she lay on the sofa and talked, she kept playing with it, opening it, putting a finger in it and shutting it again and so on. Now, this is clearly a reference, as Freud said, to uh, masturbation and wanting uh, to play with their genitals. And Trollope's small house at Allington also refers to an old embittered squire who actually rented out her small house next to his large house to his sister-in-law. Uh, his, his brother, in fact, died. And, and the reference all the way through, through, through the novel is his need to um, have some kind of sexual relationship with either one of uh, his daughters, uh, one of the, 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 the daughters, or, or in fact, uh, the widow. So the sexual intent is unverifiable, of course. But I think the parallels that we see with the use of language, obfuscation, prolex, lots of words, I can't help but see the link between the briefings that we get with COVID in particular, those daily briefings we see from our leaders throughout the world and how they use words to avoid uh, uncomfortable truths, especially at the beginning of, of the, uh, the crisis. Um, the important one, I think, and I, and I, I have uh, the New Zealand Prime Minister up on the corner there, Uh, Jacinda Ardern. There was a, a, a briefing in particular about two weeks ago where they did start talking about the preparation for the COVID crisis. And there was an admission, albeit a little bit under the microphone, saying that they were in no way ready to be able to deal with the COVID crisis as it hit New Zealand. Um, if you remember at the time, the number of ICU beds was somewhere between 120 and 130. And the number of ICU beds available in New Zealand was only around about 55. We didn't have the amount of testing we needed to see what the actual amount of disease was in New Zealand. We were no ready, nowhere near ready. So the, the obvious pragmatic thing to do was to actually go into lockdown. I think history will tell that maybe it was the right thing. If you look at the other leaders, they dress in a way that is appropriate for what we describe as leadership here. Um, and also the leadership meetings. If you look at, uh, there's a, a, a particular briefing, um, which you'll see in the notes that I provide of President Trump's on the 20th of March, where he's actually fed with questions to actually show what a great leader he is and how he can uh, demonstrate his leadership skills of how we can deal with this uh, crisis. Basically, what we're doing is really obfuscating around the, the truth. We can't speak about the potential fate of people, the population, if this disease takes hold. And when we look at the disease in the United States now, we're beginning to see exactly what this truth is. And yet at the beginning of the crisis, and as we still progress through the crisis and these news briefings, that people still aren't able to tell us their failings, they're unable to tell us the real truth about where this is actually going, partly because we don't know, but no one is actually prepared to say we don't know. 
And I like to actually ask the challenging question is, why is it we expected of our leaders to know everything? Why can't we actually demonstrate some kind of vulnerability to be able to say that actually we don't know? We don't know the answer to everything. What we have to actually also understand throughout history, if we take the example at the moment through the Syria crisis, what we have to understand, we just need to have a, 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 an eminent speaker of truth. Our political responses throughout crises are usually grossly insufficient and they are unrepresentative of our views. Syria is a classic example. And I use this lovely picture here of we're speaking, we can speak with smiles, we can speak with suits on. So we present in a way as Trollope would like us, represent our class, and we speak with obfuscation and prolix. We say words, but they don't necessarily have meaning. The meaning can be lost in many, many words. But also, I wonder why appearance is absolutely everything. Why is it that we expect our leaders to appear in, in nice clean suits as their males with ties? Or why we expect our women to dress in a particular way? It's just as Trollope's characters actually had to dress in a particular way and Trollope describes them beautifully. And they had to speak in a particular way. They had to eat in a particular way. And they had to talk each other in a particular way. We've sort of got away from the original idea of Aristotle's ethos, pathos, and logos, and we replace it with Armani and the dollar. Appearance is absolutely everything. Even to the farce of having Donald Trump appear at the Lincoln Memorial, and there he is, he's actually, and, and I can't understand why anybody didn't think about this, he's actually dominated completely by the statue. He's made to look small. Why didn't anybody think of it? But it was a, an idea of actually, if we can actually put him with Abraham Lincoln, maybe he'll look like Abraham Lincoln. It's a shame he doesn't look anything like him and he's much, much smaller. We have to get to this idea in all our relationships, whether we're speaking to others, intimate partners to us, people we know well, or whether to others, others. We have to get to the art of telling the truth rather than telling the truth, but it depends on what I really want to tell you, how much I have to obfuscate. I want to change tack slightly, but something that really came out of the COVID crisis was uh, something that was widely publicized, was the act of suicide by one of the doctors in the emergency department in, um, uh, in the United States, in New York. What I, what I think is important out of this is, first of all, there is a background of suicide anyway in the United States, and in particular in, in, the, uh, in, in physicians. And, and physician suicides have been an enormous problem in the United States. And the suicide rate of male physicians is about 1.4 times higher than in the general population. And this is the staggering figure for female physicians. It's 2.27 times higher. It's always been an issue. It's clearly we're putting our doctors under a lot of pressure. And you can ask the question is, is it because doctors have access to the means to commit suicide? Is it because of what they do? Or is it the circumstances under which they work, the expectations under which doctors are put to? And I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about this in, in a minute, about is, is this something that we have brought upon ourselves as a medical profession? Or is it something, a combination of many things, of history, the role that history expects of us, that the people expect of us, and it's something that we perpetuate. What I'd also like to talk about is how this actually um, is, is, is a continued problem and a continued problem for New Zealand. New Zealand has an increasing suicide rate. And to put this into perspective, um, Māori are much more prone to, uh, to suicide. We have uh, a, a suicide rate of 28 per 100,000 in Māori and around about 11.49 per 100,000 in Pacifica. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a tragedy. And, and when it, it comes to young people, it's around 73 per 100,000 population of 15 to 19 year olds. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. It also got to me reflect during uh, COVID was, of course, we had Anzac Day. And I want to talk a little bit there is about appearance of how we, we talk of how these expectations are of our leaders. And really that, um, 
that thing that we haven't, uh, we believe that we should be saying because we have to honor our dead. And I like the, the, the this, this is a poem by Geoffrey Hill, there's no relation to me. And he says, ingratitude still gets to me, the unfairness and waste of survival, a nation with so many memorials, but no memory. The picture is one of the Anzac Bridge, which is just outside of Ekaterhuna, a small town in the North Island of New Zealand. And I also quote the Anzac Day speech by the Governor General of Australia, Patsy Reddy. She says, today, the Anzac legacy should serve three purposes. To call on us to thank those earlier generations for their sacrifice, to energize us in looking after our more recent veterans, and to inform us of what those earlier generations would expect of us today as we faced our generations, generational test. We mem remember on Anzac Day for a reason. We are proud of our Anzac forebears. Let us make them proud of us, lest we forget. To me, this is something that is really just a gesture of words. And I wonder how proud that my ancestors would be of when I see the children in New Zealand living in poverty. 20%, 27% of our children living in poverty. When I see the gap in wealth in New Zealand, when I see the health inequity in New Zealand, is that something that I should be proud of? What it actually says is that our systems, our structures are no longer serving the population well. It puts up this challenge of what is democracy? What is health democracy? It's a very challenging question. It's a very complex one. There are no simple answers, but we have to start addressing that issue. How do we start making changes so can we start providing and delivering health for everyone? I'm gonna start off by looking at the medical profession. We all start off, and I'm no exception in this, we start off with that youth, that lovely idealism of joy of what we're trying to do with a vision of what we can achieve in this, of trying to bring health care and caring for people. The structures, our training, the things that we are expected to do, not only what we see in terms of the violence that we face on a day to day, we face death. It's not only the death that we face with our patients, that's something that's acceptable in a at a level because our training allows us to do that. But what is unacceptable is the structural violence we face within the system the hierarchical structures we face from our peers, the violence and bullying we face from those peers who are managing us, the intractable bureaucracies that inhibit and stop us doing what we should do, that gradually wear us down. And in that respect, here we are in the 21st century and look at the structures that are no different. As a doctor, we go around the beds in the same way, with the same hierarchy, the doctor and the nurse and the patient subordinates in the bed. Nothing has changed. We have gone trying to go from cure rather than care, and we're still at that cure model. What we have to do is look at trying to manage long-term conditions rather than acute care. And as we progress, and hopefully as we come out of uh, COVID, we have to look at how we can use modern technology to actually get towards a health and wellness model rather than just an acute care and sickness model. So what we have to do is look at what those constraints are. To me, one of the great constraints has always been the bureaucracies. And of course, as, as clinicians and physicians, we're all part of that. We're all part of the system. And it's in our hands to start making those chains. I use an example. This is actually the new Christchurch Hospital Acute Services. It's over budget and over time. It was due to open in July 2018. It looks like it's not going to open now until probably late 2020. The original budget was 483 million. It looks now it'll be over half a billion dollars right now. In a broadcast on Sunday, March the 1st, it was suggested that already and it hasn't even opened yet, that it's at capacity. This is a building that has to last for another 20 years. So unless we actually rethink what we're doing and the way we deliver it, we're going to run out of space in these centers, which are already designed at capacity. 
it's a failing not only of bureaucracies, but it's a failing of healthcare professionals who are having input into the design. We want to maintain the status quo. We are failing to keep up with the changes of what society is thinking and the way it works. This takes me on a slightly different tack. I want to talk about how our society has actually changed in the way it works, the way it operates. And Professor Graves, Claire Graves and Ken Wilbur, Brief History of Everything, these references will be available on the slideshow in the notes section. And what Claire Graves and Ken Wilbur talk about is that society actually develops in cyclical patterns. It doesn't go in slow ways of development. It goes in a, it goes to a slight uh, a, a development to a cycle, and then it goes in a great leap to another cycle and a great leap to another one. The Industrial Revolution will be a good one. And I think at the moment we're on that, 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 that verge of going to another level, a great, well, it's a, a great revolution. And maybe COVID is the great driver of this. What we have to make sure is that our structures and our organization are ready to actually deal with this, um, this readiness in our thinking as a society. Let's not get be pulled back by our politicians and the bureaucracies that support them and the bureaucracies that support our organizations. We have to be able to move rapidly to a new way of thinking so that we can start listening to what those voices in our communities really want us to do in order to make our lives better in this post-COVID environment, especially with this avalanche, I think, of unemployment coming on to us. There was a lovely book published probably about two or three years ago, and this is really emphasizing the point that we're in a position on the verge of doing something, but we don't know quite what it is. This is a book published by a group of people from around New Zealand called the Interregnum, and it's probably better called the second interregnum. The first interregnum was the civil war in Britain in the 17th century. Um, and the interregnum is that period of time where there's something going to happen in political structures. We know that what we've currently got in terms of democracy isn't working as we should be, as it should be working. There's something needs to replace it, but we don't quite know what it is. And really it's for us to start driving that. It's for us as a community as a population to start shaping what that should be. And I do, I do like, this, is, um, this was one of the, um, the protests around the, the fires with, uh, the, 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 if you like, it's demonstrating that separation around what the people see and what they're demanding and what the government response was. And the other one, of course, is around climate change. And here we have this, this direct effects of climate change the, the, the weather events that we see, the um, flooding and the fires of Australia, those indirect environmental effects from climate change, which will include the increased exposure to in micro, microbial and contamination. It might well be the epidemics like uh, COVID, pollens, particulates, air, air pollution, and uh, in, in particular, the climate change will cause disruptions of health services. The disruption of health service being caused by COVID would be an example. Social and economic factors, including migration, housing, livelihood disruption, stresses, food insecurity, and the social economic deprivation that comes out of it. Maybe we didn't expect to see it in this way from COVID, but can we see COVID as a direct effect of climate change because of that closeness, that urban creep, that relationship of, of animal, um, animals and viruses carried by animals now directly affecting humans. The consequences of climate change will have an effect dramatically on mental health. And I have noticed that in my experience directly clinically during the COVID um, uh, lockdown. The important part of this, of course, climate change will not be spread evenly across populations. It will exacerbate socioeconomic and ethnic health inequalities and inequities. That's why we set this up, the Health Hub project, to look at those determinants of poor health. We must look at transport, we must look at food, we must look at agriculture, housing, waste, energy, industry, how we design 
urban areas, urban territories, water supply, radiation, nutrition and health. It is vital that governments start listening to the voices of people. I think of the mental health inquiry where they actually ask for a clear locus of responsibility for social well-being within central government. And our central government really seems to have denied that. We have to, it asks. It asks us to tackle the social determinants that impact on those multiple outcomes that lead to inequities within our society. It has to enhance that cross-government investment in prevention of mental health issues. Poverty is a key driver of that. There is a close relationship between poverty, mental health issues, and suicide. It is an undeniable research established fact. The other thing, I talked just a little bit about precarity earlier. What I also want to talk about, and I thought this was really beautifully shown by um, the, the uh, uh, Māori in Northland and parts of the East Cape, is really trying to, it, 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 what it does actually expose how physical structures can actually isolate populations and how our physical structures and isolations with diseases like COVID and those vulnerable populations are actually more exposed to diseases like COVID in particular, but other things. So what, we, what they did was actually isolated themselves even more from COVID than we were by just uh, by, by the uh, uh, level three, level four uh, lockdown. It was the voice of people talking. We are vulnerable, we are more vulnerable than you, we need to close down. And I wonder if that was a white group, if, if, if a white group had actually closed down parts of Auckland, whether or not it would have got the same publicity it does. What it actually exposed is that structural inequity that pervades our social, uh, social order in New Zealand. This, this is a slide that actually, it's, it's really uh, looks, it's, it's a very, uh, quite a busy slide and I do apologize. It's using the Gini index. It's showing the relationship between income inequality and mental health. The higher the index, the greater the inequality because of those have and those who, those who do not have. And New Zealand's actually quite, quite high up there. And for the majority of 10 year period between 2007 and 2016, the rate of suicide for those living in the most deprived areas, quintile five, was significantly higher, around twice as high than those living in the least deprived areas in quintile one. For these years, the highest rates of suicide were generally for young people between 15 and 24, and middle-aged adults between 25 and 44 years of old in those deprived areas. What is also interesting, those suicide rates that I quoted before, if you think of what the, the, the death rates, the mortality rate for COVID in New Zealand at the moment is four per million, those suicide rates per million in those, those younger generation is probably about a 300 per million. It is, a, it is a real crisis and it's a crisis driven by poverty. So what, what, what can we do? This is um, it's a, a very busy slide and I don't expect you to, to um, uh, look, look at detail in this. This is uh, work by a, a, a guy called Frederick Leloux, who's from Belgium. He, he worked for one of the uh, consultancy companies that did um, uh, advice around organizational development, organizational progress. He, but basically, he, he just got pissed off with actually talking to companies, advising them how to do things, and then taking not a blind bit of notice and just continue to do what they do. And what he's done is he used the work of uh, Professor Graves and Ken Wilber to try and generate a different way of thinking about how we can reinvent organizations. And it comes to my point that unless we actually rethink our structures and the way we create organizations, we can't be in any way ready to respond to change in an agile way. And that's what we have to be able to do. And at the Health Hub Project, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create an organization that is agile enough to respond rapidly to the demands put on it by its population. And I'll talk a bit about the colors in a minute. 
the, the picture is a picture of one of the uh, uh, roads just uh, near where I live. Um, and it's look, overlooking the, the Pahongana Valley in, in the North Island of New Zealand. And it's an example that Lalu uses about bureaucracies. And he uses an example of, for example, in a drought crisis, the forest gets full of, full of anxiety. But in a bureaucracy and in a, a hierarchical forest, the top tree is asking the rest of the trees, the committees it creates to address the issue of drought. What do we do to respond to this? So the committees form and they go out and form think tanks and ask um, what's going on on the ground. And they come together and they come up with a resolution about how we're going to solve the problem. And they come back to the leader and say, well, this is our plan about how we're going to resolve this problem. And the leader thinks, oh, well, yes, it's a reasonable one, but I don't agree with all of it. Go back and rethink it and tell me when you've got an answer that I agree with. So they go out and rethink it and they come back to him about uh, you know, six months later and say, hey, we've got a solution for this. And then the leader looks over, over the, uh, the, the, the plane and the forest and says, well, it's a great solution, but it's too late. The forest has died. This is what's happening in our crisis. Our bureaucracies are not able to deal with them. They are too cumbersome. These layers are self-serving and self-serving in terms of their own interests, a political interest within themselves. They might be well-meaning individuals, but within the context of these bureaucracies, they're unable to deal adequately with crisis. They're not agile. And this is a, a, a diagram of, uh, it, it's actually from the, the, uh, the, the Gate, Bill and Galinda, Belinda Gates Foundation about the complexity of particular health issues and about how we can start looking at each territory in the world and how each of their problems is magnified. And you, if you look at this, you can look at this in terms of COVID and how each of the uh, countries affected and how the amount of disease in each country grew. And you can see the complexity of the problem and you can see the complexity of the response that's needed in order to address it. So our structures are not able to, to address it. Our structures in New Zealand were not able to address it. We just responded by closing the country down so that our structures didn't have to respond to it. They weren't able to. It took time for them to actually gear up in order to be able to address it. We, we, look, at, um, we look at solutions um, and you know, the NH crisis, NHS crisis in the UK will be an example. We look at solutions and say, hey, we need to change, put more money into it. And I just asked the question, is actually money the solution? Um, there's a lot of uh, data published around uh, the, the need to put more money into healthcare. We can put lots of money into it, we can put the whole of GDP into it. It won't solve the problem unless we address the issue. The fundamental issue is we have to address wellness. We have to change the model from sickness to wellness. We have to think leanly and strategically about how we reduce our bureaucracies. A third of our spending a third of our spending is waste. Over, if we look at the, um, over the last decade or so, only probably about 50 to 60% of our care has been delivered in line with what we describe as level one evidence of consensus based on guidelines. So it's actually saying, hey, our care has been delivered. There's evidence to say this is adequate. This is what we should be doing. That's only 50 to 60% of it, okay? And around a third of medicine, as I said, is waste. And there's no measurable effects or justification for this expenditure. So money is not the solution. The rate of adverse events across healthcare has remained about one in 10 for the last 25 years. So that wastage is also causing adverse events. Dealing with this stagnation is remarkably difficult. We have to deal with it in a new effective way. And this is why we talk about system-wide. It can't be just at looking health. It has to be looking at all the ways, all the things that affect health, all the things that affect wellness. Just, uh, just looking at the, the word, I, 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 I've been a bit of a fan of Kafka in the past and remain a fan. And I love the way the word Kafka S has entered our, our vocabulary. And I talked about this when we talk about one of those um, things that affect doctor health 
and probably affects all of our health is when we encounter these bureaucracies where we find no way through. And you can understand the frustration that people feel when they have to go to MSD and they just can't get through the bureaucracy. That sense of anger when you don't have a way of actually being able to shake someone and say, don't you get my position? This is where I'm at. How do I get out of this? Can't you understand? There is this big labyrinthine bureaucracy saturated by a state of paranoia. Oh, if I do this, my boss won't like this, and then their boss won't like that. So we're all susceptible to this sense of paranoia. Someone's watching me all the time. Let's get to a point of empowering those people who do the work to be able to respond to the person in front of them. It's actually what we described as actually creating a value for the person who is delivering the service to the person who's receiving the service. There was a lovely article published in the Harvest Business Review in 2017 by Kenneth Siegel. And what he says that bureaucracy is destroying value in innumerable ways. It includes slowing problem solving. It discourages innovation and it diverts huge amounts of resources and time into politicking and working the system. That's where we get the wastage. CEOs themselves are substantially less likely than frontline staff to see bureaucratic barriers in their organizations. And it is bureaucracy that's keeping healthcare from keep it getting us better. My next slide is really me anybody in healthcare or probably anybody with bureaucracies, and I think particular in times of COVID, we're sitting there, we know there's a train coming, we know that the, the, the points are gonna change and squash our fingers, and there's nothing we can do about it. There's a supply and demand uh, inequality, I suppose. Supply is grossly, grossly uh, way behind the demand. And it's the divisions and wealth driving poverty and equity and archaic systems that are also helping that. Population growth, population aging, disease prevalence incidence, service utilization, service price intensity, workforce expectations. What do, what do the people working in health healthcare expect? Um, what are the client expectations? What about workforce planning? What about the my, millennial, my generation's expectations? Uh, IT, artificial intelligence, social media, all of the things that are dividing um, our thinking around what is the supply and demand. What do I want out of healthcare? How is this affecting health democracy? I'm actually waiting. I know this is going to happen. And here I am in healthcare and healthcare delivery, waiting for it to happen. And I feel utterly powerless. The bureaucracy I have sitting around me are absolutely powerless to do anything about it. So I go back a little bit further to 2013, and this was an article published by Porter and Lee in the Harvest Business Review. And what they actually talk about is actually going towards value-driven healthcare is rather than actually making incremental fixes, is actually by making and creating a fundamental new strategy by maximizing, and this is in healthcare, by maximizing value for patients, maximizing value at its absolute core, which is actually, uh, actually creating the best outcomes we possibly can for our patients, but at the lowest cost, which actually means we've got to get rid of those layers that create costs, that one third of waste, those um, bureaucrats that would not be able to see where those um, layers that they put in are actually stifling those innovations that could create that lowering of cost and the delivery of improved outcomes. We must move away from supply driven healthcare system organized around what we do as clinicians towards patient-centered and community-centered systems to around what communities want, to what patients and communities need. We've got to shift the focus away from volume and profitability of service provided, i.e. those physician visits, numbers of hospital procedures and tests, to the numbers of patient outcomes achieved. So it's not looking at hospitals and what hospitals deliver. It's not looking at how well our communities are, how well our populations are, 
So it's not just about delivery of healthcare, it's about provision of health, provision of good housing, provision of good environments, healthy environments, provision of nutrition. We must replace today's fragmented systems, join everything up. We must see that no local provider offers a full range of service. We have to join things up. We concentrate things together so everybody talks to each other. It can't be fragmented. So when a person comes to see a healthcare provider, that they can walk out of here knowing that they can go somewhere, they know where to go, that the key, key to their care is, is going to be delivered to them. They don't have to go and seek it. It's actually coming to them. Muir Gray talks about this and in his center of excellence in evidence-based medicine. And he talks about value in three ways, allocative, technical, and personalized. It's that personalized value that I really like. And this is determined by how well the outcome relates to the value for each individual and the individual and their family and their community. That's what we have to strive to get. And this is what this is trying to say. Get away from that bureaucratic low value to that high value personalized delivery of healthcare. This is about, uh, and, and uh, I'm sure um, uh, some people uh, seeing this will notice, this is Singapore. This is about uh, a democratization of prosperity. Singapore probably is probably the one um, of the most undemocratized uh, countries in the world. Uh, and it, it has a, a nice superficiality of prosperity, but underlying it, um, there is a, a real gross inequity of both healthcare and wealth. And it's, it's this really that got me thinking in particular about um, what health democracy actually is. And it's delivering health outcomes that are important for the individual. This idea of personalized value is delivering that health outcome for the individual and the context in which that individual lives. So we can't just see the wealth on the outside. It's what we feel as the individual, how that wealth affects me and how I see it for my family and my community. It's that democratization of prosperity. Um, this is an example of democratization in my own experience. It's a, it, it may seem a little bit pathetic, but it, we, in, in living in the UK for many years, we used to support, a, a, or still do, a football club called Portsmouth, which is on the south coast. They, they, they went bankrupt through various uh, reasons. Um, corruption may well have been one of them, and also spending well beyond their means. Um, but basically, the, uh, the, the, the fans uh, took over the, the, the cup. They, they raised money, um, uh, kept, it, kept it going. Um, it was led by the person in the centre of the picture called John um, and uh, managed to raise money and find other investors and sustain the club. And the club is still going. Um, it's nowhere near at its heights as, as it was, but it's doing quite well. And it's the uh, Portsmouth Supporters Trust, I think, showed what can be achieved when people work together for the good of their community. And there was no doubt that the Portsmouth Football Club was very much the focus of the community and still remains the focus of its community. The next slide is really part of, um, it's, a, it's um, a model developed by uh, Levesque, who's a French Canadian, works in Australia. And it's actually looking at all those things that create barriers to people um, accessing health care. And I think it also, if you look at the detail of it, I won't go into the detail of it now because there's no time, but really it's those things that are barriers are those things about, can be addressed by looking at things like poverty, education, um, housing, and also urban design about how people access healthcare our transport infrastructures and so on. So it's not just about, equity is not just about saying, oh, you can access healthcare because I've designed this beautiful building and get a bus to get there. There's lots of other things that prevent people doing that. It might be the building in itself. It's the way we design the building. It's the way people are in the building. How accessible is it? How approachable are people? 
how approachable is the medical model, the Western medical model of care? It's, it's all of these things that actually make, make it inaccessible. And also, are people who are trying to address the model of inequity, the bureaucrats themselves, part of the problem? And I just use this bit of example of Darth Vader. And um, we, we've got to alter the deal. There's no question we have to. And what uh, Darth Vader talks about is, pray I do not alter it any further. So what I'm saying is, we as healthcare providers, as people working in healthcare, we have to start looking at ways of delivering it in a different way by bringing in lots and lots of other disciplines to make sure that we provide uh, health in ways that is talking to those people who can work together and in particular, listening to the voice of the community, hearing what they say so that we can deliver what they want involving all the other providers in a way that is seamless. So it's standing back and challenging assumption which power is enacted. We have to be radical with the solution. It's a deep transformation. We have to be seismic in the change. We have to deconstruct and analyze. Healthcare is non-linear. We have to be non-linear in our thinking. Our current structures are dysfunctional and fragmented specialist silos. We have to overcome those barriers to great service delivery. We have to create something that's right for us. We have to ignore those structures that create barriers. And that's what we're trying to do. We can only do that if we have the voice of the community and the support of the community. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, this, this slide is, um, it's, it's a by, uh, it, it's Tauranga. It's a, um, a piece by Russ Ackhoff, who talks about doing the right thing. And what he basically says is that we spend so much time doing the wrong thing and putting lots and lots of money to make the wrong thing righter. And you think of bureaucracies and healthcare. Oh, and the, the, the slide I put about the NHS. Yes, let's put more money into the NHS. The systems and structures are wrong. They're fragmented, they're bankrupt. Third of its ways, put more money in. We just put more money in to make the wrong thing wronger. What we have to do is do the right thing. If we, put, if we get it wrong and correct it, we actually make it righter. We don't make it wrong. That's what I like about the Russ Ankoff statement. That's what I like about what we're trying to do. What we have to do is get away from the, the sick model. Talcott Parsons talks a lot about the, uh, the sick role, the social role of sickness. And of course, the Western model of healthcare really works nicely into that. And, and of course, in our role in healthcare, we see that. We see a lot of people consuming health and our Health and Disability Act. Uh, labels our, our people coming seeking healthcare as consumers. It is a commodified entity. And in some ways, that's the thing that is driving demand. It's an unhealthy way of looking at it. So what we have to do is change our way of thinking. It's the thing that drives cost, is making it more and more doctor-centric and hospital-centric. So if I look at the model of the, 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 the wonderful McDonald's. Why is a McDonald's burger cheaper than a salad? It's because the major content of the beef burger is cheaper to provide. The beef is cheaper to produce. It may be because it's subsidized, but it's still cheaper to produce. If we look at healthcare, healthcare is really expensive. We focus on the provision of healthcare in a hospital base. The health care structures in hospitals are enormously expensive. And if you look at the recent budget, the money is actually being provided to hospitals. It's incredibly expensive. A lot of it will be consumed by the DHBs themselves. One third of it will be wasted. What we need to do is start thinking ways of redistributing that. So we want more in the communities, more at the bottom. We talk about an adult primary care physician shortage. What it is, is more accurately de described as a gap between the adult population's demand for service in the community and the capacity for us to deliver it. What we have to do is look at ways of delivering that care in the community in a different way. Look at other people who can deliver that in a more effective way. We don't necessarily have to have doctors 
or nurses, highly trained clinicians delivering it on the ground. We want to provide healthcare people, people with knowledge, with the ability to communicate with those people with greater knowledge as they need to. We need more of those people on the ground to provide healthcare education, wellness education, and in particular, the things around, I just like to call it mental wellness, people working in communities, delivering those essential services. Why can't they actually work in the, the local dairy? Why can't they work in the community centres? Why can't they work in the libraries? But knowing that they have access to healthcare provision at a higher level with more knowledge, if that is needed. The other issue that I think we have to address is the issue of selection of doctors. This is the, the number of Doctor Whos we've had. Those Doctor Who fans, I'm sure, will see that. And there's a nice little article in the Medical Teacher 2015 about selecting medical students. I think we've got it wrong. We're selecting the wrong people. And despite that abundant supply of really academically outstanding applicants to medical schools, and we see it, we're over, overrun with number of people who can qualify. And in medical school selection, you basically take the top. But I wonder whether actually that's the right people. And the popular media implies that admissions committees are still getting it wrong in a significant number of instances. How can this be so when our procedures are directed unashamedly at selecting the most highly academically and intellectually qualified students? The expectations is that they will make the best doctors. And you have to challenge that assumption. It's time to be radical in our change in emphasis in the way we select. Maybe we should be actually selecting not from the fact that they're academically gifted. We just need to select out those people who would not make suitable um, positions or healthcare workers and take, the, take those people who would be the most suitable, not necessarily because they're the most academically able. So we've got to get away from this idea of doctors, and we've all been doing it, for, I've been doing it for the last 30 or 40 years, working in isolation in the shadow of the giants, that past hanging over us, that expectation of ourselves being the font of all knowledge and wisdom, knowing everything. It's time that we actually start getting rid of those barriers of talking to others, of how we can share knowledge from others not necessarily in the medical profession. I am actually don't want to keep working in the dark because I'm afraid of going out and asking people to say, I don't know, and then going home and having to think about the mistakes I might have made. It's really like working in a cage. I have to unleash myself. How many of us working in our current environments, whether it's in healthcare or otherwise, want to get out of that working environment? We want to be in a place where we can liberate ourselves to do the job that I feel I'm able to do at the point of delivery. I want to get away from the incumbent of a boss trying to tell me how to do my job better, whether I work in MSD, whether I work in hospital, whether I work in the shop, whether I work in a cafe. This is what Lalu talks about reinventing organisations. We're trying to get to a point of working in a tier organisation. We want to become self-managing, where those people doing the work manage themselves. They're delivering it, get them to answer the solutions to the problems that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. It's that idea of having an evolutionary purpose, serving and fulfilling the pe people that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, making sure that we have a fulfilled life. If we're fulfilled, the people we serve have fulfilled lives. And I love the, always the image of the trees. This is actually a, a painting by David Hockney called Wolfgate, which is fragmentation to wholeness. That's what we as individuals have to achieve. We have to develop a wholeness in ourselves, develop a consciousness in ourselves to understand where our egos inhibit and prevent ourselves from being ourselves in the context of what we're trying to do. It's this idea of delivering a teal organization, an organization that is able to work organically, to be able to respond to the needs of its population. I just love this. Uh, anybody who's a, um, a runner will know perhaps of the Shelf Transcendence 3,100 mile race. It's the world's longest certified race. 
It started in 1996. Um, and what it does, it, it actually goes around Queens in New York. Um, it's 5,649 laps around one block in Jamaica, in Queens, in, in, in New York. It basically, they have 52 days in which to complete this. And they run from something like 6 a.m. to midnight, and they run on average around 60 miles every day. At the end of it, they get a prize. They might get a T-shirt, a DVD, or maybe one of those little medals that everybody gets at the end, you know, the one you hang around your neck and you show to your relatives so proudly. The thing about it is it's about that sense of fulfillment. It's about understanding yourself in the context of where you are. And what we want to be able to achieve is that in the workplace, that consciousness raising so that we can be true to ourselves. If we're true to ourselves, we can be true to the others around us. We can trust the others around us. So we can tell them, I do not know, or I believe that what you're saying isn't necessarily correct, or this is what this makes me feel. We can be honest to ourselves and honest to our clients. It's true, true organic organizations, a true wholeness. And that's what we started the Health Hub to try and deliver. So this is us. We designed the Health Hub project to deliver something that is different from what we currently deliver in healthcare. The four co-founders, Pat Nolan, Helen, Andrew, and myself. Unfortunately, and very sadly, Pat passed away on the 1st of May, um, which I think is really ironic for someone who is a great believer in um, social justice, which is something we all share. So what we're trying to achieve is not only social justice, but health justice. We've designed the health, health hub and the building itself so that we can communicate with each other in a transdisciplinary way. We want to be able to work with each other to follow the problem. It's a complex issue, and these are birds flocking. We want to become transdisciplinary in a way so that we don't necessarily have to talk to everybody. We just respond and sense to what's going on around us. We are a transdisciplinary team whose members develop sufficient trust and correspondence to engage and teach and learn across disciplinary boundaries. Team members have to entrust, prepare, and supervise the sharing of all of our functions. We need to talk what we call a common language. It can't just be the lingo franco, where we can talk our own language, but we never understand what everybody else is saying. It can't be a Creole, where you have a vague idea of what the other language is. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, sorry, we won't want to speak the uh, pidgin English, get my languages right, the pidgin English. We want to be able to speak Creole, the language where everybody understands what we're talking about, including the clients we relate to. It's bringing in all of those people, regardless of where they're from or who they are, to get towards this teal and actually, ultimately, that ability to transcend everything in a turquoise way. And it's also making sure that the design that we have in what we do, the constructs that we be build, the buildings, I, the examples that I have here are the Guggenheim Museum, the, uh, the, the Trump Wall, uh, dividing uh, uh, Mexico from the United States. And actually the final building is the acute services building in Christchurch. Uh, if anybody goes to the Guggenheim Muse uh, Arts Building in, in Bilbao, if ever there was a building where design really suits purpose, it's that. It's, it's beautifully architecturally designed and it really fits in with, the, uh, with what's inside it. Um, you have to look at the, uh, the, both the, the Trump wall and the uh, Christchurch building to say that really design no longer fits purpose and really they're outdated already. We have to start looking at really integrating design. The building on, uh, on, on the, uh, the, the left is really constructing something that fits in with our environment and also has to have some kind of architectural purpose for it. So it has to fit in with our environment. It's the idea of developing something that responds to our environment, but it's also contextually and consistent with the organization that we're trying to, to, to construct. The Health Hub project has set up itself both organizationally in trying to way we're to develop. We have to do it in a way that can deliver it in a, a business sense too. Unfortunately, we work in an environment uh, that is um, 
dependent on funds. We, we set this up as a, a social investment enterprise. So we have um, involved um, investors from our community. Originally, we wanted to set it up entirely as a charitable trust, but unfortunately that wasn't possible. We couldn't uh, get the money as purely as a charitable trust, but we've had uh, lots of generous people within our community prepared to invest in us, knowing it is a social enterprise, that it is for the benefit of the community, but also there will be some return on investment to them as investors, but also a return to the community, for the community to have a say of what we do with that. And the you know, trust that we have um, established, which is independent of the Health Hub project, will also put money back into the community in a way that the community is asking. So the final slide, it might be a bit like creating a movie and hoping that all the bits, the cuts that laid on the floor are going to come together to make a coherent story. So I hope it has some clarity in it of what we're trying to do. I hope it also creates a lot of questions. And, and I think in healthcare and in health, there is no one answer. It is incredibly complex. It's also trying to answer the complex question of what is health democracy? And I think it is in providing answers to the solution of poverty. We have to address the issue of poverty and social justice. We have to address the issues of inequality and equity. And above all, we have to address the issue of our failing democratic process. We have to make ourselves more accountable as democracy to the needs of the people. We have to listen to the voices of our community. Thank you very much for listening.